Good morning, everyone. This is Mark Herkin, and welcome to our Friday morning virtual um, uh, educational program. Um, we have a wonderful program set up for uh, today, but before we get started, I do want to put in a quick uh, note of advertising um, for the upcoming World Congress on Thyroid Cancer uh, virtual program that's scheduled for October 16th. Um, the final plans for that program are underway. There are um, a, a number of conference calls and uh, planning sessions that are taking place, and it promises to be uh, really an outstanding program. Uh, so I encourage all of you to, um, to visit the uh, World Congress uh, website, um, and if you're interested, uh, to make arrangements to join us for that day. Um, this morning's program um, is uh, being given by Dr. Susan Pitt, um, who is uh, in the midst of changing her um, uh, her allegiance, um, if I can uh, say that, but more importantly, her institutional um, uh, um, uh, location where she's going to be practicing. Um, she is now the Associate Professor of Endocrine Surgery and Director of Endocrine Surgery Research at um, the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, she was at the University of Wisconsin, um, where she was an assistant professor with an appointment in public health. Um, and that's a product of having gotten her master's degree in population health sciences from Washington University in St. Louis. And um, also, uh, she completed her general surgery at um, uh, at WashU, followed by a fellowship in endocrine surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital in uh, Boston. Dr. Pitt is an NIH-funded investigator um, on focus on uh, trying to align treatment decisions for patients with low-risk thyroid cancer um, with their priorities and goals, and she will be talking about that this morning. As always, I encourage um, our listeners to um, send in questions. Uh, we will uh, try to save some time at the very end of the hour um, uh, to get to them, so I encourage you to do so. Um, and with that, I will turn over the program to Dr. Pitt and thank her for um, agreeing to, uh, to speak this morning. Thank you, uh, Dr. Erkin, for the wonderful um, uh, introduction. I'm excited to uh, be here to speak about this topic. It's something that I've been doing a, quite a bit of research on, but haven't actually had the opportunity to give a talk on in terms of the barriers of adoption to active surveillance and low-risk um, papillary thyroid cancer. And I feel like I should have added in, in the United States to the title. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on some work that our, my group has done, um, uh, along with some collaborators um, at both Memorial Sloan Kettering and Mayo Clinic. Um, and a few other locations as well. And then I'm going to talk about one other study, and there's a lot of other research out there, um, and so I'm happy, I think, to cover that um, towards the end. I don't have any um, disclosures. Um, the introduction is really pretty quick. I think we all know that the incidence of papillary thyroid cancer has increased significantly. You know, the most recent SEER data do show some tapering off um, of the curve, and this has been primarily due to small, um, uh, low-risk cancers. Um, and there's been significant um, concern about overdiagnosis, um, you know, nationally and internationally, as we know from uh, publications in the New England Journal. And these data are a little bit um, older, but prior to the 2015 um, release of the American Thyroid Association guidelines, you know, anywhere from 70 to 90 plus percent of patients were undergoing total thyroidectomy who uh, had low risk thyroid cancer. But at the time, the treatment options in the guidelines were primarily this. Um, you know, total thyroidectomy and lobectomy, but then in 2015, suddenly they threw active surveillance in there. And if you read the guidelines, which I imagine everyone on the call has, we all kind of know that there was this less is more um, theme to the last set of the American Thyroid Association guidelines. And so, you know, Dr. Pitt, I, I'm going to, I'm so sorry, I'm just going to pause you for a moment. Um, I'm going to try to reshare the screen because I don't think that we're able to see your slides advancing at this time. So I'm oh. going to go ahead and send that request again. I'm so sorry. It's okay. All right. Well, I was sort of through these. You can click through this. This is just the incidence of PTC and, and saying that active surveillance, and now there's less is more um, next. 
Um, so my group, when we've looked at this, and I apologize for the technical difficulties, um, you know, we've tried to take a, a look at looking at both the patient and sort of family views, but also, which is kind of the icons on the top left, the, you know, surgeon and endocrinologist views, and we've looked at um, patients and, uh, you know, surgeons uh, actively making decisions in audio recorded conversations. And I show this mostly because it will just help you orient to what group of people we're talking about next. So I'm going to start just by talking about some stakeholders. Um, we uh, next uh, developed a group um, of uh, 16 stakeholders that included patients, family members, um, endocrinologists, a couple of um, fellowship trained endocrine surgeons, a general surgeon, an laryngologist, and a radiologist. And we um, were a little concerned about power dynamics. And so we met separately with the groups and then would meet together and then separately and then meet together. Um, uh, next slide. And what we were really interested in doing was finding out what information patients need to make a treatment decision. Um, you know, because with active surveillance becoming a new option, um, we felt as though, you know, what were what were patients want to know? And all the patients who were part of our group, you know, had been treated prior to the 2015 guidelines. And so they hadn't really been given the option of active surveillance, but we also felt as though they had a good perspective. Um, next slide. And I didn't expect you to be able to read all of the information on the last one, but I at least blew up here in a larger Font the um, information about active surveillance. And I'm not going to go through absolutely all of these details, but the patients really felt as though obviously everybody needed to know this was an option and really what everything uh, entailed if you're undergoing active surveillance, um, as well as that surgery is always an option, that there are plenty of people walking around with thyroid cancer that don't even know it, um, and that um, you know it avoids the side effects potentially with thyroid hormone or surgery. Um, and that you know people do eventually undergo surgery, some who are initially choose active surveillance, and that there's really no difference in survival. So those were the main things. Next slide. Um, so we wanted to look online to see what how good the information was out there. And so we looked at the top 20 uh, websites on the um, three most uh, uh, used um, search engines. Um, and there was a lot of overlap in the websites. But if you look on the next um, slide, basically this, there was not a lot of information about active surveillance out there. And we did this around 2017. So it was a, you know, at least a little bit of time had passed since the guidelines had come out. And there was about one in three that actually mentioned active surveillance, but there was um, very little information about it. So if you look at the little sub bullets underneath there, um, you know, it didn't really describe that it need, you require serial ultrasounds or who it's appropriate for or uh, any kind of the pros and cons um, next. And so this really became, um, or we felt like this was a huge barrier with the education and the awareness about active surveillance um, from the patient perspective. And so then we did some patient interviews. Next slide. Um, and in this study, we interviewed, um, we developed our interview guides with our stakeholder group. Um, and then uh, we interviewed 10 patients, all who had small cancers that were less than one and a half centimeters. Um, they had all undergone thyroidectomy less than five years prior. Um, and that was really because the you know, patients were all treated during the time uh, prior to the active surveillance um, uh, endorsement coming out. Next slide. And so um, this is a publication from thyroid that we had in You'll see the same uh, slide. We published both the endocrinologist and surgeon's um, attitudes and beliefs with patients, but the interviews were all done separately. And so I'm just going to show the patient um, information here uh, first. Um, next slide. Um, and the uh, there were really a few themes that came out when we did these interviews that were barriers to active surveillance. Um, next. And so what the barriers uh, really were, you're going to have to hit that like three times. <laughs> for cancer fear um, and you know this whole like reaction to the c word you know I, I hear the word cancer and i just i'm scared to death or and that's what's highlighted with the yellow box or um because there was a nodule there you just had to kind of get it out and then the lower box really talks about how surgery patients just assume surgery is the default right like oh i have cancer oh it's going to come out um, you know or they uh, oftentimes will even ask about chemotherapy um, and then i think that there's this um, 
you know, concept that everybody thinks of that if the cancer is removed, they're going to have peace of mind. And I do think some patients uh, really do achieve peace of mind, but I think some just trade, you know, um, worry that they have cancer for worry that the cancer might be coming back. Next slide. Um, and so we also um, asked some other questions um, for the same patient. So it's the same patient population, but we asked them about what treatment options they considered and about how the treatment um, decision was reached and um, how um, the surgeon influenced their decision. Next. Um, and when we looked at this, um, one of the challenges that we found in the decision-making process um, next was that um, you know, patients really didn't understand what was going on. They, they would say, oh, I'm so nervous. Um, I didn't understand or there was so much going on. And so I think that those emotions were getting in the way um, of understanding. Um, next. And then the other, um, one of the other main barriers was just that, you know, patients had a lot of confidence in the surgeon. Um, and they, you know, some said, oh, I didn't even make the decision. I didn't have a choice, um, that kind of thing. And next. Um, that really told us that like the physician recommendation is a potential barrier. So if physicians aren't recommending active surveillance and the patients aren't going to necessarily, um, you know, want to undergo active surveillance. Next. Um, and so this is just a, a brief summary of what in those sort of, in both our stakeholder engagement and our patient interviews, we identified as barriers to active surveillance. So obviously awareness and knowledge is a treatment option, the physician's recommendation, the whole decision-making process, just understanding what's going on and what the options are. I think cancer fear and the emotions related to a cancer diagnosis, um, surgery, um, just being assumed to be kind of this default treatment, um, even the prospect of peace of mind and then worrying about um, cancer um, spreading um, on surveillance. So I didn't show some quotes about that, but that was also another theme. Next slide. Um, and so then we moved on to start talking about um, and looking into what about, you know, what about the providers, the, you know, surgeons and endocrinologists taking care of these patients. Next slide. Um, and so this is the um, study that I mentioned already from thyroid that we published. And we interviewed 24 um, patient or sorry, um, endocrinologists and surgeons. Um, they were all interviewed at the American Thyroid Association meeting. And when we did these interviews um, in 2016. Um, so shortly after the guidelines came out, um, and we chose to do this at the ATA meeting, um, mostly because we wanted um, people who are familiar with the guidelines, um, who are the most likely to actually be doing active surveillance um, clinically in their practices. Um, and we wanted a good sample that was national, not just sort of the local um, surgeons and endocrinologists in Wisconsin. Next slide. Um, and the themes that we saw from them uh, were somewhat similar. They talked about the physicians a lot about the patient's need to get it out and that being um, a barrier uh, next. And so, um, and you can just click like, I think two times. Um, and then I think uh, the, you know, and then again, they also identified and this sort of mirrors what we saw from the patients that everybody just assumes that surgery is the default. Um, and also that, you know, that peace of mind is something that would be gained if the cancer is removed. Next slide. Um, and so we also um, had a portion of the interviews that really, really focused um, just on active surveillance. And so we published this separately. Um, so this is from uh, the same group of physicians, um, but we were really trying to characterize the barriers and facilitators. Um, next slide. And um, you can just skip that one next. And we used a framework. Um, there are several different um, ways that you can look at barriers and facilitators. Um, Cabana is someone who published a paper back in JAMA in the late, I think, 1990s um, with an initial uh, framework on this. Um, and it was barriers to guideline adherence. Um, but this was something that there's uh, Fisher et al. built upon. Um, and they divided the barriers and facilitators up into things that were physician related. So you can see those in sort of the reddish pink color. And within those, there's physician attitudes, but also physician knowledge. Um, and the attitudes, you know, have to do with, you know, what outcomes people are expecting from some, whatever treatment they're gonna give is gonna happen or whether or not they can give the treatment, whether or not they even agree with the guideline or whether the treatment should be given, um, you know, whether or not the culture there is uh, ready to change and whether or not they are motivated. 
Um, and under knowledge, it's really like, are you aware um, and how familiar are you with it, right? Like you could be aware that active surveillance is a treatment option, but if you don't know um, anything else about it, then you're obviously going to be less likely to um, recommend that for your patients. And then there's guideline related, which you can see in the green, um, which really has to do with the evidence behind the guidelines, what the goals are um, of the guideline, and how complex or easy they are to follow. Um, and then the external barriers um, and facilitators include things like social norms, um, you know, so societal beliefs and clinical norms, uh, as well as collaboration, um, organizational um, structure. So, you know, could this be done within your organization and resources? Next slide. And so I'm going to show these um, just some kind of quotes uh, for, from the study for the interviews. I'm not going to go through them in too much detail, but under the position attitudes, we saw a lot of um, things about outcome expectancy and around sort of the expectancy of the referring physicians. So the, the one I have highlighted there just talks about, you know, a couple of referring physicians basically said, I want the whole thing out. And the surgeon said, I can't do that. Um, and then, um, you know, I think, you know, also there's sort of this general agreement, and this one gets a little bit into the idea of cancer fear as well, you know, it'd be hard for me to not even treat cancer, um, you know, by just watching it. Next. Um, and so we felt like these, a lot of the barriers we saw here were just these beliefs about the outcomes of what would happen, you know, could the cancer spread or not, um, which is, you know, theme we saw from patients, but also um, just sort of beliefs about cancer um, and then, you know, there were some, and I didn't uh, read them, but about their ability to perform, you know, I think this was early on, so people didn't necessarily know what to do next. And then in terms of knowledge, you know, this group, I felt like uh, had very high knowledge, but they did talk a lot about in the interviews, you know, what might be going on in the community um, next. And so the barriers there, you know, was obviously awareness. Um, and then in terms of guideline, you know, um, related factors, because this was earlier on, this was prior to the publication of some of the more long-term um, outcome data, but there was a lot of concern about evidence. People were like, how long am I going to do this? Do I surveil somebody for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Um, you know, and also some uh, uh, concern about not necessarily the complexity of the guideline, but the complexity of having to follow this and losing patients to follow up next. And so when we kind of summarize those, I think um, you know, we felt as though at the time there was lack of long-term outcome data and then just not a lot on protocol development um, and specific endpoints because the guidelines didn't really tell us how to do this. They just said we thought this was a good idea. Next. Um, and then external factors. I think these were some of the other um, major ones were just these social and clinical norms, like we've always done it this way, so it's hard to change, or, you know, this is America, nobody wants to live with cancer in their body, um, you know, um, just like the logistics and the organizational structure, so not just the patients having to come back all the time, but, you know, you know, the last quote on the bottom left there says, you know, we don't have enough endocrinologists as it is, you know, my clinic is booked out six months, so, you know, how are we gonna, if we have patients coming back more often, for more ultrasounds and you know how are we going to deal with that as both an organization and, and resources next and so to summarize those those were really you know societal beliefs and clinical norms but also again patient and patient reliability in the amount of time and ultrasound their quotes aren't in this table but there was some um, discussion about ultrasound quality and how good is this and how are we really going to be able to tell if these are um, growing or not Next slide. And so once we had all of this qualitative information and information from our stakeholder groups, our group was like, well, let's do some quantitative assessment, um, particularly around PTMC, so papillary thyroid microcarcinoma treatment recommendations, that we did ask about some cancers that were a little bit bigger. Next slide. And so we started by doing a survey of um, organizations. So we um, or, uh, surveyed the um, AAO, HNS, the American Academy of Oligarchology, Head and Neck Surgery, the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons, and the American Thyroid Association members. Next slide. And um, 
we um, published two papers from this. The first, you know, the um, data collection was done in uh, 2017. So this is, you know, now another year later. And this one was done by email. Um, and we did do a mixed method analysis because we asked some open-ended questions uh, as well. Um, and I think that these, um, again, highlighted some of the same themes. Next slide. Um, and so if you looked at the group from this uh, first survey, um, it was about, you know, a little over two thirds were surgeons. Um, and that's probably because we oversampled surgical societies. Um, these are mostly uh, private uh, or sorry, um, uh, academic settings. So not in the private practice. Um, and mostly like we're, you know, 95% nearly were familiar with active surveillance. Um, you know, about two thirds had experience performing active surveillance. But when you looked um, at the number of patients that they actually surveilled per year, it was very low. Um, and then, you know, this was a group, again, that was very familiar with the guidelines. Next slide. Um, and one thing we did ask was just about beliefs around the different treatment options for patients with a low risk papillary cancer measuring um, one centimeter or smaller. And most felt that, um, and that's what's highlighted on the right, is that active surveillance is underused um, in the United States, um, which is, you know, not surprising in that total thyroidectomy with radioactive iodine, if you can look at the opposite side, is overused. Um, next slide. We asked a series of questions about beliefs, and this was um, based on sort of the frameworks by Cabana that I mentioned and Fisher, um, you know, and for the most part, you know, this just shows those who um, responded is was on a five point Likert scale, but that they either agreed a great deal, quite a bit, or somewhat. Um, and you know, for the most part, people felt as though they knew how to determine um, if a patient was appropriate for active surveillance, felt comfortable discussing it, um, knew how to follow people, um, felt comfortable offering it, and had sort of the resources. Um, but I. Um, again, this was, I, I think, people who, um, you know, were mostly academic, um, and so that I'll show you the answers differ a little bit when we asked a different um, group. Next slide. And so, you know, this shows you that, you know, some of the barriers might be knowledge, self-efficacy, and resources, but for this particular group, I, I don't know that that was as um, big as it was um, when we did ask another um, group of physicians. Next slide. Um, and then, you know, uh, people had some reservations, but not a ton, um, that patients undergoing active surveillance, you know, did they have concern about um, having poor outcomes? That was not as a major concern amongst this uh, group, but they were, I would say, concerned about the psychological burden on patients and sort of in the, um, about the vagueness of the guidelines um, and the evidence. And so um, the barriers, you know, here were just about this sort of patient burden and sort of how do we do this? The guidelines are a little vague and the evidence is not, you know, out there. But again, this was four years ago. Next slide. Um, and we did also ask about potential interventions um, that people would be interested in. Um, financial incentive was not something that was um, very popular. Uh, I think having information to share was something that people thought that they would or might use, but it wasn't major. But the most um, of the three things that we asked, the most common was that um, having some sort of signed consent form or some sort of, you know, standardized way to um, sign patients up or inform them about, um, you know, active surveillance. Next slide. Um, we also asked the physicians in this survey what management strategy they would choose for themselves if they were diagnosed with a eight millimeter papillary cancer that was completely low risk. And 76% actually said that they would um, choose surgery next. Um, and interestingly in this survey, the endocrinologists um, were more likely to prefer active surveillance. So about almost 40% of endocrinologists compared to 18% of surgeons um, were interested in active surveillance if they themselves were to be diagnosed with um, papillary cancer. Next. And so we asked the, um, them, and this is the qualitative part of this study, we asked about whether or not, um, you know, or why people would want whatever it was that they chose. And so if you looked at the reasons for choosing surgery, people just felt maybe they didn't have confidence in active surveillance or, you know, surgery is curative, it's definitive, it's safe. Um, next. Um, we also asked them about reasons for not doing 
active surveillance or some of the reasons that they said as opposed to being pro-surgery were um, why they wouldn't do active surveillance and some of those were you know, had to do with age um, the time commitment uh, to have serial ultrasounds um, just the concept of not wanting to live with cancer um, the unknowns um, that are kind of uh, related to that and then just kind of worrying like that you'd be this one person who gets widely metastatic disease and so overall, we felt as though there was a lot of kind of fear, cancer fear and worry in these um, uh, responses, and definitely also, I think, some of the logistics as well. Next, um, they also had, you know, for those that chose active surveillance, um, you know, a lot of the themes for that were, you know, avoiding the risks of surgery, um, you know, the probability of progression is low, it's pretty easy. Um, you know, that they're too busy to take off time um, and that it's safe. And so it was really interesting to see how uh, some of the same exact reasons were used for why people chose each of, um, you know, whether they chose uh, intervention or active surveillance. Next. Um, and so we also use those same data to really um, do a more uh, quantitative and advanced analysis looking at factors influencing the treatment recommendations next um, and so you know in terms of factors not surprisingly the um, cluster of bars on the left show tumor size and there was a base case of um, a 45 year old female with a solitary eight millimeter papillary cancer with no adverse features and if we altered the size of the tumor you know obviously the um, yellow is sort of showing you who had uh, recommended active surveillance in these case scenarios um, and as the tumor size um, went up, the number of people uh, recommending or proportion recommending active surveillance went down. Um, the middle um, cluster shows you, we asked about age and comorbidity. So for younger patients, people were less likely to recommend it, but for older, more um, at least stands for life expectancy. So particularly if someone's life expectancy uh, was less than 10 years. And we also asked about patient preference. So like if a patient didn't prefer surgery, nobody was recommending it. But if the patient, or sorry, if they didn't prefer active surveillance, if they preferred surgery, um, and then, it, but if the patient preferred active surveillance, then a significant number um, went up, but it was still, you know, um, less than 80%. Uh, next. And then this was just showing you, this was the uh, data from the physician preference um, for their own treatment. Um, and, you know, a little over 20% preferred active surveillance. Next slide. So we did a logistic regression and there's some other information in the survey that I didn't uh, present. Um, but when we did this, so anything that's to the right of um, one, uh, you were more likely to recommend active surveillance. Um, and uh, anything to the left of the middle line or one, um, they were less likely to recommend active surveillance. And the factor that was most predictive of recommending active surveillance was if the physician preferred active surveillance for their own treatment. Um, we also, in this study, randomized people to receive a brief um, one-page information sheet prior to taking the survey um, about active surveillance, which showed that that did shift people towards recommending it. Um, which suggests that at least in a short term that, you know, physician education could be a potential strategy for increasing uptake. Um, and then, um, you know, endocrinologists um, and, uh, you know, patient preference were the other things. And then if um, patients were, um, or I guess if the physicians believe that the patients um, gained peace of mind from surgery, then they were less likely. So that's the last bar shown in the peak. So it was really interesting uh, that sort of the own treatment preference and specialty came into play here because it wasn't something that we were expecting to find. Next. Um, so then we, uh, as I mentioned, we did another survey. We surveyed the American Medical Association. Um, and part of this is because the prior, you know, interviews and surveys that we had done were, you know, with people who were relatively high volume um, and more academic, and we wanted to get a sense of what was going on in the U.S. in general. Next slide. And so we did this in uh, about October 2018, and this is actually a mailed survey, um, and we used a $5 cash incentive, and we gave two hypothetical cases, the same sort of standard case um, that I showed you before, the 45-year-old female with the eight millimeter, you know, papillary with no adverse features. And we gave the case where the patient preferred it. And to do the analysis, you know, there's a lot of um, 
uh, information on uh, adoption of um, new practices. And, and so we use sort of the adoption um, sort of framework to divide people into people who either were not adopters, so they said no for both cases. They would not recommend active surveillance even if the patient preferred it or for the base case versus sort of adopters, meaning that they recommended it for at least one of the cases. Um, and then amongst those adopters, we had divided them into partial or full adopters. So those who would recommend the um, active surveillance if somebody um, for just a general case, um, or if they wouldn't recommend it for a general case, but would if the patient preferred it, they were partial and full was if you said yes for both. Next slide. Um, and uh, we had a 33% response rate. We mailed up uh, 1,500 surveys and got a little um, over 450 uh, responses. Next. Um, and the one thing that I just want to point out here, so these are mostly not academic, um, tertiary or even academic affiliated. Um, and uh, so it was definitely, we did get to reach the population that we were interested in. Next. Um, and so these are all shown, so the non-adopters are in the black, which I've highlighted yellow a few times for um, discussion sake, and then the partial and full adopters um, in the right. And so, you know, awareness was a little bit lower. It was like, you know, it was about 95% um, uh, in the prior study, and here it was a little bit lower, as well as the likelihood that there people were using ETA guidelines, um, and they, we were much less likely to actually discuss um, active surveillance or to um, know how to determine who's appropriate. And so um, we really felt like awareness in a, at a national level uh, in the community, as well as like self-efficacy for actually performing active surveillance um, were significant barriers. Next. Um, uh, people who um, wouldn't recommend active surveillance for either case also um, were less likely to believe that active surveillance is underused and they were less likely to want to actually use it or increase their use or think their colleagues were using it, which I think are all, um, you know, barriers. Um, and they also um, felt as though they did not have resources to perform this. And so, um, you know, this is yet another barrier. Next slide. And um, the last few, and we kept the um, scale for all of these, so it goes to 100% on each, but um, you know, again, um, a fair amount had reservations about it. Um, they felt as though active surveillance made them anxious. They were concerned about the poor outcomes. Again, the psychological burden on patients was a burden. And so from that, you know, we were concerned about, um, you know, obviously the psychological effects and outcomes on patients. Um, next. But also, if you look, it's interesting, um, you know, about 3% said that their patients are actually aware of active surveillance prior to seeing them. And so that was a, you know, a patient barrier um, around awareness and knowledge. Next. Um, so in terms of other research, uh, next slide. Um, this is a, a study that was done by the group here at the University of Michigan um, by Dr. Hamer and her colleagues. Um, and she had done uh, a seer linked um, study of uh, patients and then identified their physicians that way. Um, and this uh, was a little bit of a different um, uh, population because these are you know, physicians in two areas of the country, in Georgia and Los Angeles, um, and they, they had an excellent response rate. Next. And so uh, if you look at these data, next, the um, you know, number uh, doing active surveillance um, uh, or who felt that active surveillance was appropriate it was about two, uh, three quarters. Um, and then, you know, if they're actually currently recommending it, it was definitely less than half. Next slide. Uh, and so, you know, we felt as though there are definitely some, you know, agreement with the guidelines and whether or not they think it's appropriate. Maybe it's still an issue for many physicians. And they did a similar analysis. So um, those um, with odds ratios on this side, so to the left of the line, less than one are less accepting of active surveillance in those um, with odds ratios more than one. So it's similar to the graph that we did. Um, uh, and those who were, you know, otolaryngologists were a little bit more likely to think active surveillance is appropriate. And uh, those in um, non-academic settings felt as though they were um, less likely. And so again, we saw this theme around specialty and practice setting. Next slide. Um, in this um, multivariate um, 
um, regression, they showed or they were looking at whether or not people or factors associated with not recommending active surveillance. And the more years in practice, um, the less likely uh, people were to recommend it. So next slide. Um, and then lastly, they also asked um, they also asked the percent of or um, reported the percent of survey physicians who reported each of a bunch of barriers that they asked about. So um, they asked, you know, uh, several different things. But if you look at these, you can hit next. Um, the first few cluster around patients. Patients just don't want it. Um, so they don't prefer it. Um, and there's no um, reliability to follow up. Um, or it's just going to lead more um, patient worry. But there was um, next um, some concern, and we hadn't asked about this, about malpractice, um, uh, as uh, well as, you know, protocols and some resources. Next slide. Um, the last bit of data I'll show you, and then I'll um, wrap it up, um, was, has to do with um, some interview, or not interview data, but um, we audio recorded conversations between patients and surgeons to see what was being discussed about active surveillance. Next slide. Um, and this will come out. This is um, information from our poster, but uh, this is accepted to thyroid and hopefully should come out uh, in the next couple of months. Um, but we audio recorded conversations at the University of Wisconsin and Memorial Sloan Kettering. We audio recorded 30 consults. All the patients had less than two and a half centimeter um, papillary cancers that were node negative. Um, and, uh, you know, several of them. Um, chose surgery um, as opposed to active surveillance um, or were undecided. We had nine surgeons that participated. Next slide. Um, and one of the things that uh, was really interesting here, so these are the quotes from um, the inter or the conversation, was there a lot of discussion around emotion. Um, and a lot of times, even if, um, you know, sometimes the patient initiated it, but not, you know, always. So, I've highlighted here just the um, parts where people uh, talked about total thyroidectomy and lobectomy, and that was the preferred um, uh, either treatment or that's just was what they were discussing about it. And you could you could um, uh, see that there was a lot of themes around cancer worry um, and peace of mind with you know removal. So you know you, the second quote on the the left column says you know what I hear is important to you is peace of mind. Um, and I think a very thoughtful total thyroidectomy can certainly try to give you that. Um, you know, where they talk about how the benefit is that, you know, you don't have to worry about it uh, after um, it gets out. And we saw that with both um, after the cancer's out. So we saw that with both total and with lobectomy. Next. Um, but when you look at the sort of things that were discussed around active surveillance, particularly um, in it's hard to tell the way I presented this. The last slide was um, emotional um, related positives, and these are emotional related kind of drawbacks. You know, were about you know all this concern about is it going to spread, um, you know, an anxiety. So next, um, and so again, there's this theme around cancer, fear, fear of spreading, um, you know, worry and anxiety. Next. Um, and so I'm just going to summarize here kind of what we found from all of the different groups, and then I'd uh, love to have a discussion. Um, so in terms of the physician identified barriers, um, you know, they, you know, often talked about patient preference expectations um, and cancer worry, but also awareness and knowledge, um, beliefs about um, cancer, ability to perform surveillance, you know, and then lack of data, lack of protocols, lack of resources and expectations next. Um, and then, you know, malpractice um, concerns, you know, specialty, um, you know, I think those are more related to clinical norms. Um, some say practice setting may be as well. Um, and then, you know, just whether or not you agree or disagree and concern about burden on patients, logistics. So the, the list I feel like is quite long. Um, next slide. Um, I'm not going to go through these, but we did ask in um, our interviews what were strategies people suggested for preventing overdiagnosis or overtreatment, um, and you know uh, things that people you know suggested in it other than just education um, yeah, included things like you know um, reclassification of low-risk cancers, which uh, has been done to some extent, you know reimbursement uh, models changing, 
resetting patient expectations. They talked about um, resetting referring um, physician expectations as well and, and engaging the media. Next. I'm also um, won't totally go through this either, but within the framework um, that I showed you earlier, um, that one of the reasons why we chose to use it is because it's already paired with strategies that if that's a major theme or barrier um, for um, actually, you know, making change. So I've sort of highlighted the ones here with um, for physician-related barriers next. Um, they have a whole set for guideline related barriers next, and then as well as a whole um, set for um, external barriers. Next slide. Um, and then these are the patient um, related barriers, and I won't read them uh, back to you again. Uh, they're the same ones I showed before, but more just to kind of summarize. I think obviously awareness and knowledge was huge, but so are things like cancer, fear, um, and uh, worry. Next slide. And so, um, the only reason why I uh, highlighted all of those um, briefly in turquoise, no, nope, it's fine to leave the side where it is, um, was because I think that these are all actually like addressable barriers. Like, um, and so this was just to say, you know, I think that there's hope um, that you know active surveillance is something that there can be increased uptake of um, in the United States because I think that in some other countries around the world it's been um, used effectively uh, a lot more. Next slide. Um, I just want to thank all of my uh, mentors and research team uh, throughout all of this and my clinical colleagues um, and uh, collaborators. Next slide. Thank you. That's it. And I apologize for the technical difficulties. No worries. Uh, Susan, that was great. Um, and thank you. Um, uh, it was uh, really um, uh, very engaging and very interesting to hear what your um, studies uh, um, identified. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could comment um, at and go up to 10,000 feet and talk about um, guideline adoption and changes to guidelines in general versus the specifics of um, uh, active surveillance. Obviously, that was a, a quite a radical change in the grand mm -hmm. scheme of um, thyroid cancer management. But how how unique do you think um, uh, the adoption of active surveillance is compared to other um, innovations in, in guideline utilization? Yeah, I mean, I think I mean one of the problems is the just the amount of time it takes for dissemination. You know, so I feel like from that ten thousand foot view, right? You know. You've got usually, and part of the reason why we went from kind of the group who, you know, or who's at the ATA meetings or who are part of these um, organizations who are very active is because they're the sort of, you know, if you do use that sort of um, dissemination guide, they're at the forefront of, right, pushing the change. And then we, you know, slowly, um, you know, uh, asked about others. And so I really do think that just dissemination is huge. And we don't have, like, with at least with, in the United States, I mean, there's so many different specialties that treat each different problem. Um, and then, you know, right, like I, how many times do you actually have to do your CME? And, you know, for like what I do, they don't have one that's endocrine specific. So then it's, um, you know, if I'm upping my boards, there's probably not gonna be anything on there about this, you know? So I just think, you know, there's not a great way to do mass education, if, you know, other than through meetings, but then not everybody's going to the meetings. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, the data show that, you know, sometimes to get from, you know, a research idea to like actual change takes 17, you know, plus years. And I, I do think that there needs to be a, a system for better um, dissemination of guidelines. I don't think that, that um, this is unique. You know, if you look at the prostate cancer literature, active surveillance has been around for, you know, over 20 years, I think now. And people are still talking about disseminating active surveillance. Great, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to just uh, recognize one of our initiatives, which is to um, take a, um, a, a, a different approach to guideline dissemination, which is um, something called TIRO, uh, which hopefully we'll be um, promoting in a, um, uh, in a more uniform way here, but um, it's a online 
um, access to international guidelines that are much easier to access and much more easily um, uh, sort of worked through by clinicians on the front line. Um, but that's a that's a separate topic. I do want to get to some of the questions. There are a number of them in the time that's remaining, um, so that I can uh, get uh, address those. So um, the first question really relates to um, treat surgical treatment um, from high volume thyroid surgeons and uh, why we don't talk about high volume sonographic um, expertise. Um, in order to be able to effect more effectively monitor um, thyroid microcarcinomas. Um, is this a factor that patients should be made aware of um, if they're going to be put into a safe setting for appropriate surveillance? Yeah, I think, um, I do think it's something that patients should be aware of, right? Because if you don't know like the quality of what you're getting, um, you know, then, then that should be part of your decision. It certainly was a theme that came up um, in our interviews that people were concerned about the quality of ultrasounds. I didn't report um, that or discuss it much here. And we did ask some questions about it um, in our second survey, um, you know, and I think it's, you know, huge. And, you know, and there was some discussion um, that I didn't get into too much either about should active surveillance be done everywhere or should there be centers that are specialized at doing this because they have all of the resources and that kind of thing. You know, and of course, you know, patients don't like to travel a lot of times. I mean, they don't even want to go 20 miles sometimes, um, let alone hours and hours. So I think those are, are barriers too. But I do think, you know, patients should be aware of, of, what it takes to do good surveillance. Do you do you have? Uh, we've talked about this in a number of different sessions that we've run on um, on this platform, and certainly attitudes in Japan about uh, returning to um, major medical center uh, for their sonograms um, is quite different than it is in the U.S. And certainly, the pandemic has posed significant challenges for being able to um, continue a protocol and um, at a, you know, at a ter perhaps a tertiary center. Um, do, you, do you feel that um, there should be uh, levels of expertise that are identified? And the flip side of that is, do you um, have any data that would look at um, kind of uh, when changes in a nodule or a cancer size or the presence, the emergence of novel lymph, lymph nodes has been missed in a less experienced, uh, by less experienced clinicians than it, um, and then uh, identified later or um, through further review in a, um, an academic center. Yeah, that's um, really interesting, you know, because I do think that the level of expertise is is key here, right? I mean, I this is why we have, at least I feel like, um, you know, it was common in my practice in Wisconsin for somebody to get a surgery locally and have, you know, nodes three months later that somebody just didn't, you know, look at. Um, and so, you know, I think just a, 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 an appropriate or better quality preoperative ultrasound would change the care for, you know, those patients. So I do think that there is um, that, and I think the pandemic has made it harder. I think it certainly has made it harder. I mean, we, they weren't even doing, um, you know, quote, elective type of ultrasounds or things like that, um, you know, for a while. Um, I don't personally have any data about changes being missed. I think it's something that's important to um, to follow. Um, when we have um, enrolled patients in active surveillance, we are very specific about having to come back. You know, if you don't think you can do this and um, come here every time because the quality of the ultrasounds frequently that we get from the outsider um, just so, um, you know, it's kind of subpar and you know, the patients end up coming in the ultrasound them completely fully again in clinic, um, which does take a lot of time. And I, I noticed that there was, um, one of the comments um, and questions uh, in the chat where it was about the amount of time it takes to really talk about active surveillance um, uh, and whether or not that came up in our research. And it didn't, 
Um, but it's interesting. I find it takes a really long time to, to talk about surgery sometimes too, especially if you're discussing total and lobe and really informed patients. So um, I don't know if that, that was why. Okay. Um, the, the question, one of the chat questions came in about generational change in patients mm -hmm. and thyroid specialists. It seems like your data supported the fact, that notion that um, uh, clinicians that were in practice longer were less likely to adopt um, this change. Um, obviously, as time goes on, that that will uh, that will naturally evolve. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? And also, in terms of the age of the patients who are more likely uh, to adopt active surveillance as a as a treatment approach here. You know, um, the the age of, or sort of the experience, I should say, of the um, providers is something that's come up also. Um, we did a study looking more about recommendations around um, total or um, lobectomy, um, or total thyroidectomy, I should say, or lobectomy um, for low-risk cancers that were one to four centimeters. And one of the factors that we found associated with being like more likely to um, recommend uh, lobectomy was um, you know, years in practice. And I don't know if this is, if it's a generational thing versus like an experience, you know, because in our interviews, you know, we did have people say something like, well, I don't think I could ever um, recommend active surveillance. There's always going to be that one in a thousand patient who, you know, gets metastases and you miss it. And, you know, um, I couldn't live with that. Right. And so is it is does it have to do with age or quote experience or like that you finally actually seen that patient with the tiny little microcarcinoma that's just got widely disseminated disease and then that that anecdotally kind of um, changes your decision making. But it is a pattern that we've seen more than once. Um, we haven't, you know, um, other than the little bit of data I showed, we haven't asked about, you know, age of um, the patient, but I do think that that's um, certainly a factor. Um, interestingly enough, I have had some younger patients who really want active surveillance, and I've been very against it um, uh, for one reason or another. Um, and um, so I do think sometimes it's also just um, people have set up their their ways. You know, I think that the whole idea of cancer fear, um, they're if people have really, really high levels of fear, I don't think you're going to ever convince them to do active surveillance, um, or at least it's going to be difficult. Nick, um, there's cancer fear and there's surgery fear. Um, and so it depends which one of the balance uh, sort of tips the scale. Um, my um, Of interest here is, is whether you found in your recorded sessions between uh, patients and clinicians, whether they're was um, either a qualitative or quantitative difference across uh, the, I believe it was two institutions that you ran that study, and also whether you found a significant difference in the uh, delivery of information um, and, the, and the degree of conviction um, uh, as it relates to specialty and, um, uh, and, and, and the uh, clinical specialty. Yeah, you know, it's hard to say because, the, you know, we didn't have a huge um, sample of, you know, surgeons. Obviously, you know, everyone knows that um, Memorial, some kind of, you know, does a lot of active surveillance. I mean, it's particularly why I kind of sought them out to per help participate. And um, Dr. Roman, who's there, was um, already interested in doing a similar study. Um, but I, at first, I thought that there were some patterns specific, you know, because, you know, we do, at Wisconsin, we have a lot more endocrine trained surgeons, general surgery, and they have a lot more otolaryngology and certain things like that. But I do think when you when we tried looking at it a little bit, a lot of it does have to do with just the beliefs of that particular person, because um, within each each institution, there's wide variability. Um, uh, you know, so I ultimately I don't think that there really were any particular um, patterns, but um, 
I think that there were maybe some things that people tended to say more, you know, like little phrases that I think people must use than when you talk in regular conversation that then lead into your patient conversations. That was a little bit interesting, um, but they weren't necessarily something that was um, swaying anybody's mind or anything like that. Okay. There, there is an interesting question um, in the chat here related to the length of those conversations and whether kind of um, the that represented a, a clinician burden um, that influenced um, how they presented and the degree of conviction with which they presented active surveillance to, um, uh, to their patients. Um, and as noted in the chat session, it's certainly a whole lot easier um, as it was 10 years ago to say, you're gonna get a total thyroidectomy and you may or may not, but more likely we'll get radioactive iodine and um, that's a uh, perhaps a, a very quick conversation compared with um, the ones that are required in order to really inform a patient about the options that you've discussed today. Yeah, there's definitely wide variability in um, the length of conversations. Um, I think the practices are a little bit different, so you could tell that because um, we recorded like resident and fellow um, but not nurse practitioner conversations, and that probably was a mistake because I think some of them were super short, but I, you could tell that they had probably been talking to somebody else um, beforehand. Um, and uh, and so, but there was, I do think that the physician's own belief either about about their beliefs about active surveillance in general or what was right for that particular patient, you could tell in the conversations would bleed, you know, through because we are, yes, we're um, you know, here to inform patients and help them make, you know, a shared decision, but we also have the expertise um, and, you know, um, have to kind of impart that that knowledge and also, you know, if somebody really wants something, steer them away from something that's not going to be the right thing. Um, and so I don't know that, you know, um, the conversation links varied um, differently, but I think part of that is just like, you know, there's sometimes there's those patients that, you're going to take forever. Sometimes there's the, those that are just like, okay, got it, and they want to be done, and, and I don't know that it had as much to do with the content of what really needed to be covered as sometimes just either the patient or the physician style of educating and learning. Right, um, and it also depends whether this is the first first time uh, versus the, the 12th opinion um, that that mm -hmm. patient is seeking out here. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't get to the one last question in uh, less than 10 seconds here. One of our listeners is asking in whether what your experience, how that would guide um, your particular protocol for active surveillance in terms of how you uh, monitor patients. Yeah, you know, I have I haven't seen anything out there quite like what I've always thought would be the most ideal. I feel like it needs to be one of these like learning models um, where, right, like say the first one or two times of surveillance are always going to be about the same duration, whether you make it six months or whatever it is. But if they've gone so long with stability, do you increase them or vice versa, shorten them on others? But I feel like there's got to be a way using, um, you know, uh, modeling and even artificial intelligence um, or like uh, machine learning to make those sort of predictive, right? Like we we should be able to get enough data to do that. So like in my ideal, I think the protocol should be like a learning model. So it's very individualized to the patient, but also it should be like a computerized thing we have online and you just stick in, did it grow, did it not grow, whatever, and it tells you what to do. <laughs> That's my ideal. Um, so hopefully someone can come up with that. All right. Perhaps one of our listeners will will follow up on that lead. Listen, we have um, uh, gone over the, the nine o'clock hour. I have a feeling we could go uh, considerably longer. Um, I want to thank you for the research uh, that you've done um, that is uh, quite voluminous and, um, and uh, your uh, outstanding presentation this morning in conveying all that information to us. Um, so thank you, and also uh, best of luck to you in your new role and your new venue. Um, uh, hopefully uh, this will uh, uh, give us many, many more years and many more publications from uh, research that you'll be conducting in Ann Arbor. Well, absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. Be well. Yep. Thank you again. Thanks. Bye.